This episode is brought to you by Paramount Plus. If you don't already subscribe to Paramount Plus, please use our affiliate link by going to talkthroughmedia.com slash Paramount Plus. Using our affiliate link gives us a little credit, which helps us to keep bringing you great content. U.S. residents only. Welcome to episode 63 of the Star Trek Discovery Podcast. I'm Brian. And I'm Ruthie. And tonight, well, this morning. <laughs> <laughs> today. Today, we will be covering season four, episode two, titled Anomaly. But before we get started, of course, uh, we want to remind you again uh, that we are now doing a Patreon early access version of the podcast and um, just to let people know and it shouldn't be this much of a difference all weeks but this week it was uh, you guys got the episode released on Friday and the Patreon people got it on Sunday so it was a five day difference between so (laughs) um, and only because I just couldn't get the episode finished. So anyway, um, usually it won't be that much of a difference between them, but uh, if uh, you want to get early access, it's only a minimum of a dollar a month. So go to patreon.com forward slash Brian and Ruthie. So we have some feedback on last week's episode, season four, episode one titled Kobayashi Maru. So we're going to open hailing frequencies. And speaking of that uh, stuff that Patreon listeners get, um, they got to hear a lot of the sausage being made just a couple minutes ago. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Um, So we get started with errata. Incorrect. And, uh, it's got to do with some stuff that personally I missed in in the episode last week, and uh, I wanted to bring it up because uh, we talked about it on the podcast. So we said that uh, it was weird that Burnham never gave the con to anyone. That is incorrect. Um, she did. She gave Reese the con prior to uh, going over to the worker bee. And um, I noticed that Right at that time, uh, Rillick was pulling up information basically at the time that uh, he started snapping. Uh, Rillick started pulling up information about uh, Nalus on her, you know, badge. So one can assume that she was reading his personnel file and that she never went to his, his home planet or even the holodeck. She was just, you know, kind of reading it. But honestly, that makes me like her more because she was, I think, using that for good, not for bad. Yes, she was. Yeah. And she was thinking on her feet. Yeah, exactly. So that's. I that's, wouldn't hold that against her because like she said, does it matter? No, it doesn't. No. Got the job done. Right. And it wasn't like you said, it wasn't for malicious intent. Right. Right. It could be different if she was doing it for malicious intent, but she wasn't doing it for malicious intent. She was doing it to try to calm him down. So she Save could see. Lives. Yeah, she could see that he was kind of losing it. So <laughs> losing it. <laughs> and he definitely he definitely was. So anyway, that makes me like her even more. So and uh, I like her even more after this episode, too. All right. So our first uh bit of feedback we got um came in after we recorded um actually i think it came in during the week 
And that's from uh, Clint from Indianapolis. Ruthie, you want to read that one? All right. Uh, Clint says, it is it is so nice to have Discovery back with new episodes and the return of Ruthie to the network. I give this season four premiere episode a 9.25 out of 10. Queen Grudges. Great effects, interesting plot, great design, and costumes. The show has too many regular cast members and recurring characters. We are to, what, 13 that are on Discovery, including Booker, Gray, Reno, and Saru. Then there is Admiral Vance, the Federation president. Then there is Commander Pollard. And will Sukal be on more episodes? We need thinning of the cast. Yeah, you know, it's funny. Um, the shows that we tend to cover, both The Walking Dead and uh, Star Trek, seems to ha- seem to have this, like, way too many cast problem. And, yeah. uh, like, on The Walking Dead, the cast is huge. And um, it's, it's even more than what you see here. And uh, it's, you know, it's just like they have to kill people off. <laughs> <laughs> Call the herd. Yeah. And in in this case, um, I don't know. It's, it's like I think it would be difficult to kill off some of the crew because, you know, you, you got to have a crew to maintain the ship, you know? Mm-hmm. I mean, these aren't, uh, like on, uh, Picard, you know, um, they don't have like a crew of holograms. <laughs> <laughs> so that's funny. Yeah. So that would, that would be cheap, uh, as far as casting. <laughs> yeah. It would be harder for one person though. Yeah. I'm sure they're not getting paid for all of the extra characters they're playing. Mm-hmm. Which is not very cool. Anyway, yeah. whatever. All right. Um, he goes on to say, Colbert was barely noticed in this episode. No Janet Reno. An unneeded appearance of the Ghost of Grey. Three lines. Stamus was there for techno babble and engineering. Yeah. yeah. Can't say that you're wrong. All true. Um, Colbert... Yeah, you know, he didn't have too much this episode, but um he did he did have some. Um uh, and and Stamets not too much. Um and yes, no no Reno's, but I'm assuming that we're going to get her in fits and starts this season. You know, we'll we'll hear from her and then we won't and then we'll hear from her and then we won't or we'll keep hearing her at the same or seeing her at the same station <laughs> you know she'll just be in like she'd uh, been there the whole time yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah. She, she'll just be in one, um, one set for like 10 episodes <laughs> and they'll just you know have her uh saying this and saying that anyway um but yeah yeah i agree that i really enjoy her and i like it when she's there but i mean it's the actor's prerogative not to um be there when she doesn't want to be and there's nothing we can do about it and frankly pissing and moaning about it all the times i hear kind of does nothing and gets annoying after a little while because we all know why she's not here so yeah and these are (laughs) extraordinary times and uh you know she doesn't want to work more than she doesn't want to work. So yeah. and in the case that. and in the case of Tig, you know, she's a cancer survivor and immunocompromised. And uh and you know, there have been some um issues going across the border. And as far as I know, I think they've opened it up, but it's still kind of a pain to cross into Canada. So um you know, it's not like, it's not like normal. It's not like pre COVID time. So, you know, anyway, I think well, people I mean, should she just, she doesn't want to work more than she doesn't want to work. So let yeah. it be. Yeah. All right. Sorry, Clint. That was not all directed at you. We heard about it last week too, and I'm tired of it. <laughs> 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 I'm, I didn't mean for you to get the brunt of that. I'm just expressing my opinion about people need to get over the fact that Reno isn't there. She'll be there when she's there. We'll just have to enjoy it when it's there. Yes, I agree. All right. Um, next is 
LT from NC. So he heard us that uh, <laughs> he didn't send in feedback. So uh, we've got feedback this time. And of course, um, he was a co-host on Lower Decks. And also, um, we can hear him hear him on the Walking Dead talk through. So he says, since I owe you a rating for last week, I gave it eight and a half out of 10 angry moth men. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> About Michael and her issue of not losing someone. I recall a quote I learned in NCO Academy in the army. Robert E. Lee said, to be a good soldier, you must love the army. To be a good commander, you must be willing to order the death of the thing you love. Interesting. Mm -hmm. I agree with you guys that eventually she is going to lose people and you really can't save everyone every time. Then she says, or she says, sorry, LT. <laughs> <laughs> A little gender uh, reassignment there for you. Yes. Uh, then he says, well, you know, in defense, it's because I see the next thing that's written and it says <laughs> Ruthie. So I'm thinking she anyway. So then he says, Ruthie, it's ceiling boulders. <laughs> Every Starfleet ship has to have large bits of random rubble stored in the overheads, along with extra air conditioning duct work and spark producing wiring. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that must be it. <laughs> Yeah, oh, we got we got goodness. more of rocks this episode too. <laughs> yep. Oh, good times. Good yep. times. And then we got some feedback about specifically about the podcast. All right, West from Minnesota says it sounded like you two were confused by my no with this episode. No, meaning my heart broke for book. And while this emotional moment was earned by having Quajon destroyed, it was a no because it broke my heart. I think we got that, but we were trying to explain what no really is. So I hope you understand and are no longer confused by what we mean when we say no. Yeah, we have a certain, um, when we came up with the yes, no, and and uh, hold your horses are not good enough, we had a specific thought of what they were. And yes, meaning I really liked it, or it emotionally impacted me, or it was a great moment in the episode, or it was a really sad moment in the episode. No, meaning I didn't like this because it was a crappy, yeah, it's not a well-done part of the episode. This was terrible. <laughs> yeah, not just um, the emotionally impacted, like, it's more about yeses or anything that give you emotional feelings about the episode, whether you like yeah. it or you dislike it, what, what, what happened? A no is something that you didn't like the way that they did this pertaining to the episode. Not just, I didn't like that this happened in the episode. Yeah. Cause I can have some yeses be like something that I, yes, I did not like that Quajon was destroyed, but it could still be a yes because yeah. it emotionally impacted me. Right. No being, I did not like how they just let the president go on the ship. That's a no. Right. That was a poorly written and executed part of the episode. Now, hold your horses means mm, not so sure about this part of the episode. Or where is this going? You know? Yeah. Or why is this happening? Or this doesn't make sense to me. Yeah. So there you go. That's everybody. That's our interpretation. Now, if you have a different interpretation you want to put something in a different category that's fine we'll put it in where you know if you want to keep putting those where you're putting those that's fine but that's you can expect us to argue with you about it <laughs> yeah, exactly because <laughs> <laughs> we have a specific thought of what a no is and and, and uh hold your horses so um yes is, no is like this even, didn't work for me yeah, and e even the yeses, you know, we we have a different um, thought. Like the one I can think of is um, from last season that because it was brought up um, this this time. You know, when Stamet said, "Oh, you can, you know, throw me out an airlock or whatever." Well, that that scene when Burnham throws Stamets out of an airlock um, from season three, episode twelve. Um, 
that was really heartbreaking and uh, gut wrenching scene, but I loved it, you know. So mm-hmm. it would go on a yes. So anyway, that's that's what uh, that's what we mean by the various categories. So anyway, your mileage may vary. Right. All right. So let's get into this episode, shall we? Let's do it. Season four, episode two, titled Anomaly. Interesting because there already is in the Star Trek universe uh, an episode called Anomaly. So, but that gets mentioned later. Uh, written by Anne Kofel Saunders and Glenice Mullins and directed by Olatunde Osansanmi. The description from ParamountPlus.com is as follows. Saru returns to help the USS Discovery uncover the mystery of an unusually destructive new force. As Burnham leads the new crew, she must also find a way to help Book cope with an unimaginable loss. They did not give a star date again. The air date was November 24th, 2021, 11.06 p.m. Pacific time, and I basically caught it right as it was uh, premiering. So I refreshed. It wasn't there. I refreshed again, and it was there. So runtime of 49 minutes and 57 seconds. So Ruthie, how would you rate this episode? I didn't like this one as much as I liked last week. Mm. Um, So I'm probably going to give it an 8.8. Um. I don't know. 8.8. Okay. No, no flippy saying. I can't think of anything. <laughs> um, 8.8. Okay. Uh, all right. So um, I love this episode. I don't like the, the rating name I gave it, so I may come up with something better, but uh, this is very unimaginative on my part. <laughs> <laughs> I loved it. Um, and, uh, after you know successive the the rating that I gave it is a nine point eight unpredictable gravitational anomalies and um, that rating didn't change upon successive viewings so I think I've watched the episode all the way through three times and a couple of times where I watched most of it and uh, stopped. Uh, for whatever reason. Um, so uh, rather than just try to complete it, I went back and started it over. Um, but, um, I just thought that this was a really effective, uh, episode well-written and, uh, I got the feels on several occasions in this episode. So, so yeah, I, I loved it. Uh, glad to hear it looks like some people loved it and some people, didn't love it, but I don't see anyone, you know, pooping on it. So that's at least good. So listener ratings, uh, why don't you start? All righty. We've got Will from SoCal who says, I rank this episode a perfect 10, the science holds. And along what I just said, uh, Wes from Minnesota says, like last week, this episode I got to see before everyone else at the virtual premiere. I give Anomaly 8 Gravity defying bridge crews out of 10. Kyle from Illinois and Lower Decks says 9.5. Saru got some swagger now. LT from NC, also from Lower Decks, says so for season four, episode two, I'm giving it eight and three quarters out of 10, riding the wave. <laughs> I like that eight and three quarters. That's good. Yeah. Uh, Jeff X Force 11 says 9.5 adults dealing with PTSD in productive ways. Mike from Arizona says, I give this episode a 10. You might as well blow me out an airlock out of 10. It was perfect and I loved it. All right. Brian from Colorado says, I didn't like this episode as much, so we'll give it eight out of 10 programmable matter tethers. Yeah. Very split on this episode, it seems, everyone. Okay, mm-hmm. so here we go with listener yeses. Yes! <laughs> All right. 
Will from SoCal is first up. He has actually few. He says, uh, Saru returned to the Discovery crew when they needed him the most. Yeah, and I agree with that. Um, he seems to be fitting in there well. Although I do have, I do have a little bit of a you know thing. So <laughs> okay, on that. So, uh, but anyway, uh, great to see Navarre and the Federation working together for the greater good. And then he says, "This was a great episode for Doctor Culber. He is someone who senses the emotional roller coaster that the Discovery crew is going through." And the ship computer naming herself Zora. <laughs> yeah. And that, that came from the uh, short track Calypso. So. Yep. I like that too. Yep. All right. That's, that's it for Will. All righty. Mike from Arizona says, this was such a well-written episode as far as capturing the emotional bonds among the characters. From the beginning where Michael is struggling with connecting with Book, reintroducing Saru into the crew and seeing him and Michael's bond at the outset to the presence of the Navarre president and possibly representatives from earth to Gray's plans to, to transition into a synth body and how it will affect his sense of mortality to Stamets's reveal of feeling helpless in an, in an attempt to connect with and reconcile with book to the symbolic relinquishing of discoveries tether to books ship. This episode was one of the more emotionally consistent and efficient that has aired. The themes of loss, grief, and connection were so well intertwined. Goes on to say, Saru's presence on the ship just altered the atmosphere of the ship in a very calming and reassuring way. The band is definitely back together. Saru serving as Burnham's gut checker, bringing her emotional clarity and reflection. This was reminiscent of the role Spock played with Kirk. Both of you called it last week with the ship having two captains with Saru serving as Michael's first. Yes, it is very reminiscent of uh, Spock and Kirk, particularly in the movies. Yeah. Lieutenant Commander Bryce offering the save the day idea. <laughs> Colbert balancing medical and mental health services. Yeah, I really like that as well with Colbert. Tilly Stamitzing right now. <laughs> that was funny. It was nice to hear Picard's synth body referenced by Culber. The amazing gravitational distortion scenes on the bridge. So much better than the synchronized side-to-side -side shifting they normally do in the chairs. Yeah, I exactly. Agree with that. that was pretty, um, pretty, a pretty nice update, so to speak, I guess I would say. Yeah, up and down as opposed to side to side. <laughs> <laughs> no kidding. Finally, a holodeck and individual holo projector. Hi, yes, I had mixed feelings about that actually. My first thought was, how cool. But then my second thought was, my shins. <laughs> Can you imagine running into every piece of furniture? <laughs> I just thought. It did not, I don't know. I mean, maybe they'll explain the practicality of it, but I was like, man, well, how can you. Unless your, um, your furniture is, um, hollow generated too. Oh, all right. That's you know? fair. Fair. Anyway, that was my first thought was, man, if I walked into a room where I couldn't see anything, I would immediately bang my shins on something. <laughs> like, I mean, I have my, the way that my furniture is laid out pretty well memorized in my house and I still with the lights off run into things. So yeah. And it, but it, I mean, I guess it could be that your furniture is hollow projected or it could be pro programmable, programmable pro matter, matter furniture. Yeah. yeah. That if or you some go, combination. Yeah. That if you go into hollow mode, the furniture goes away. That makes more sense and makes me feel better because like I said, I was immediately like, how cool. But then I was like, Ooh. <laughs> I thought of that too. <laughs> yeah. And then I thought, uh -oh. well, maybe it's not like a full holodeck. Maybe it's like, you know, like a projector or something, you know, it seemed pretty much like a full on full holodeck. Yeah. Like, this is, which again, I thought so cool having it like personalized to where you don't really have to go somewhere because that was cool when they did it in next generation, you know, that was so cool when they introduced it, but yeah. this feels once again, like an updated upgrade, no. like making it, taking it and making it better. Yeah. All right. 
It'd be um, kind of funny so- if, if uh, like on uh, Navarre, you know, there's there's a rock and it looks like the shape of a chair. <laughs> Hey, that looks off of the much like an easy chair. I was thinking that too. I was like, well, maybe they just make the furniture into like the, but then what if it, the furniture placement doesn't agree with your hollow projection? It would never. Anyway. Yeah. So that's yeah, why I, I was thinking. It. That's why I was thinking maybe it's uh, it's just a different program. So, you know. Yeah. Well, it turns out we agree with you, Mike. The hollow deck individual hollow projector thing is cool. Um, all right. He goes on to say the way the crew, the ways the crew, Stamets, Burnham, and Saru were emotionally present for Book when he felt all alone in his grief. When Michael told him, stay with us, stay with me, I cried. That was such a touching moment near the end where he was blaming himself. Tilly reconnecting with Saru and opening up to Colbert. The end of that scene was so funny. Colbert, go save the world, Tilly. Oh, I will. <laughs> yeah. And the way she said it, too, was funny. Um, mm-hmm. That that kind of um, growly growly voice that she does sometimes, mm-hmm. yeah. Something I I didn't respond to um, from one of your early yeses about the Earth delegation. There was a shot where we see two guys that were in dark, dressed in black. Yeah, they look. It looked like they were dressed in black. Yeah, and. Like I'm thinking at least one of them was from Earth and the other one, Mm -hmm. he looked like he might have been of mixed uh, species origin or something. And I'm not 100% sure of this, but the last time that I watched the episode last night, um, I watched it on a fire tablet and that doesn't have a great resolution. But I, I went back and I watched it a few times and it looked like the guy on the right, he had some kind of like ridges, but they weren't like full ridges on his face. It was basically his eyebrows and maybe his nose, but it didn't look Bajoran. It looked, I don't know, something uh, slightly different. But like I said, the tablet's resolution is only like 1280 by 800. So, um, I don't know for sure if what I was seeing is something I could trust or not. So, Mm. but, but the other guy definitely had the, definitely looked Terran. (laughs) Yeah. The other guy definitely looked Terran. So, or earthling, earth, earthling. (laughs) Yes. I don't even know how they're calling them now. Yeah. And yeah. So I tend to think that it, that it was an earth delegation. So we'll see. All right. LT from NC is next. He says, I love the special effects. I think the new green screen studio is really amazing. I like the way that more of the bridge crew are getting FaceTime. Yes, I do too. Mm-hmm. It's good to see Saru back. So now the computer is going by Zora. Yep. yep. Like we said from <laughs> Calypso. Uh, we got our plot point tie up with Picard in the med bay and our talk about Sunyan since. Yeah. Cause, uh, that did bring up that, well, you never have to die. You just, you know, switch your consciousness over to uh, a synth and you know, you're done. So they kind of wrapped it up by saying, you know, well, the success ratio was so low that people just stopped doing it. So. Interesting. Yeah. Which I get, but also makes you wonder, well, you know, who were they successful at, at uh, getting to work with it? And why was Culber so certain that he could make it work in, in this case? You know, is it because of Adira and him kind of uh, showing up and, you know, I don't know. I don't know if it's that or if there's some other factor, but that's what I was. Well, he he said because the consciousness has consciousness had already been transferred successfully once, hmm. which I'm guessing apparently is the problem with doing that is that people can't like they, maybe they go crazy or something. Uh, 
Like that's why they don't have successful transfers. Ah, uh, because- so it's not it's not a physical thing. It's a, a psychiatric thing. Yeah, like yeah, that my, might I be. can't handle the yeah ramifications or whatever of having my mind jump into a different something or whatever. Which you know, who knows what that might, why that might be or whatever. You know, I mean, that's kind of a <laughs> the mind is such a an unknown quantity, so to speak, you know. I do know. <laughs> it's so hard. Mental health is something that's still so unknown. Yeah. And while we are writing the future, it's still hard to predict things that are unknown. Yeah. And accurately. Uh, yeah. And it's something that, like, mental health. The understanding of the mind has uh, changed drastically in like the last, you know, 50, 60 years compared to like even, even you know, yeah. even from the 80s, like people. No ridges on anybody's foreheads. Mm, okay. It's a, it's a wrinkle. Oh, it's a <laughs> it's wrinkle. A, <laughs> it's, a, it's a crease in his like. I would say it's a wrinkle. <laughs> okay. It's not, it's not All a right. ridge. It's, it's All right. a wrinkle. <laughs> All like right. You're talking about the guy on the right. The guy I, on uh, the left is perfectly um, well, smooth-faced, right. so to speak. Yeah. The guy on the right had a has a slight wrinkle in between his <laughs> eyes. <laughs> he's he's a little bit advanced in years. <laughs> okay. So he. So right now I get a incorrect. <laughs> yeah well, i mean just uh i couldn't see very well is what you said and well yeah I, and i could all <laughs> and but it, part of it was like i thought i could see some kind of difference in his um eyebrows but yeah if, the, if it's not it's if, a, if it's not it's there a it's, wrinkle or it's a, a look of consternation that you get which makes your in between your eyebr- eyes eyes eyebrows you know crinkle that's all it is it's either a wrinkle or a look of consternation you know like when you do this are you looking (laughs) (laughs) yeah yeah so it could be him going like this (laughs) yeah it could or it could be just a wrinkle in any case they both look human so it's probably the uh, delegation from earth and I hope Earth, I mean, why doesn't Earth join the Federation? Come on. Yes. They were a founding member. Ugh. I'm still not over that. Anyway, whatever. Let's move I'm on. I'm not either. All right. Well, that then. Okay. So we have one more. All right. Finally, we have Wes from Minnesota. Saru is back. Thank you, Sukal, for encouraging him to go back. The gravity defying effects on the bridge were well done. Yes, they were. All right. Uh, what did you have for yeses? Um, I liked the private channel. Yeah. Like the way that they did the private channel. It was like the cone of silence. Um, I like that the I think we pretty much named all of my yeses that the computer named herself yeah. Zora. I also itself, had itself. that. Yeah. Um and I also had the, the holodeck uh in mm, your room. Hol- A holodeck, holodeck in sweet your room. thing. Yeah. Yeah. Hollow projectors, whatever, in individualized. That's really cool. Yeah. Um, um I think that's pretty much it. Yeah. What basically the only thing really that uh hadn't been talked about too much is uh I was really getting the feels about book in this episode, like I don't think I felt the the loss of uh, Kuei Jen uh, much last week. It it didn't like impact me too much. Although I, I would say this week when I went back and watched it again yesterday, uh, I felt it a little bit more. Um, but this episode, I felt it very much, and I thought that. Um, David Ajala's uh, performance this week was outstanding. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we have something to say about 
him in our nose, but we'll, we'll, uh, it, not, it's not about his, uh, performance, but, um, there's that, um, he was, well, he was week, great. It happened at the very end of the episode too. So, right. Yeah, exactly. Just um, like but shock value. I had, I had a similar feeling to how that played out of, it reminded me of the episode family from uh, the next generation. Basically when Picard, um, you know, was dealing with his uh, time being locutus and, you know, killing, you know, all the, like basically being unable to resist, um, you know, the Borg and, and, uh, you know, all the went back to the vineyard. Yeah. Just the emotional pain and survivor's guilt and, you know, just that, that kind of thing. Like clearly book is going through a lot of survivor's guilt right now, and he'll probably go through it, uh, more this coming week, I think, or, and maybe to a certain extent, you know, the rest of the season, but anyway, it reminded me a lot of family and how emotional it was and hit a lot of the same notes. So not for the same reasons, but anyway, I, I, I did have just like, just a, uh, I could feel the heart strings pulling at me, feeling his, his loss, you know, not just of his family, but of his planet and you know that thought of like why couldn't i have stopped it or you know because you hear him say to burnham you know it's like why couldn't i have just like let them let them know um and then he also says like oh i think you froze up oh or did i freeze up i've frozen yeah I was just texting you. I was like, did I freeze or did you freeze? No, it looks like I did. <sighs> Rut row. Um, so yeah, I think um pretty much I think I gave up everything I had as far as uh guesses. I mean, I do like that they kind of tied into a knot. I, I hadn't thought, okay, I guess I'll say this cause I hadn't said it this way. Um, that I like this, that the solution for gray is a soon type Android. Um, and at the same time that, um, we got the Admiral Picard shout out and, uh, they kind of, you know, close the loop. So it was kind of like a three part, um, why I liked it so much. So, all right. So anyway, uh, that's it for our yeses. So I'm going to, since you like it so much, I'm going to give it uh, a double shot of no. So no, 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 no. Also known as no. <laughs> <laughs> I love that too. Mm, that episode was just such a great episode. Yeah. Yeah, and that's of course from Sarek. All right, that's the so, name of the episode. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. All right. Because that was actually Picard saying that. Yes. That the episode name was Sarek. Yes, and he was um, in a mind meld with Sarek at the time. So. Yes. Anyway, uh, why don't you read the first set of no's, which is not much of a set of. Uh, <laughs> Does it have much of a no? I'll do the first two then. All right. Okay. Will from SoCal says, none. It's a perfect episode that answers a lot of questions. Great. I'm happy that you didn't have any no's. LT from NC says, I'm already struggling with the random phenomena going random directions. Okay. Maybe I don't have a degree in physics, but it reeks of trope and plot device when some large spatial phenomena is being random and unpredictable. Uh, I cannot disagree with that, but I'm hoping that it's explained further later. But right now I'm kind of with you there with that one. LT. All right. And uh, LT's last no is Stamets and Book are not the buddy cop duo I was looking forward to. 
<laughs> That's pretty funny. Yep. All right. Uh, next is Western Minnesota. He says, my only gripe is that the writers chose this episode to be the same title as an episode of Enterprise. Enterprise's episode with the same name was good. This one, not so much. That's kind of a trivial, though, I would say. I mean, yes, it's kind of, um, it's true. And I don't and, think it's trivial. If you really liked that episode, then you didn't like this episode. Having it have the same na- same name is kind of, mm. yeah, yeah. And my take is, um, you know, it was bound to happen. And you know, they've come pretty close uh, in the past because we've had emissary and the emissary. So you know, <laughs> I mean, that's pretty close as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. Because a lot of um, things that, you know, cataloging systems um, ignore the word the. (laughs) Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, if you look up emissary, it will bring up emissary and the emissary together. So anyway, so that's that's all I have to say about that. Yeah. It was bound to happen after 800 episodes, though. Yeah. And we are dealing with space but (laughs) i can understand how that would be a disappointment for you no wes okay what do you have for notes ruthie um (laughs) well i have a little bit because i it wasn't very there were some things i was like "Uh, i don't really know i don't like that I okay. don't, I don't, I'm not, I, I don't really like the scenes with gray. Honestly, I mm. don't, I don't really, I'm just not, not feeling it. I'm not feeling the whole, I guess I just don't understand. I don't understand. How are they going to extract uh, gray's consciousness from Adira? How are they going mm. to, um, I, I think I'm still upset about, <laughs> I'm so I'm still upset about last last season. I just and the whole like him getting his own body in that um hollow ship thing. It's like I just that left a bad taste in my mouth and I'm still like smarting from it, I guess. I'm like, ah, this is a result of that. And so therefore I don't like it. <laughs> I know I'm quibbling and being totally nitpicky, but I'm just like, ugh. It just always reminds me of that thing I didn't like. So Well, but it's also worth saying that you had an issue with that, but they were able to reconstitute Colber from a tear of, (laughs) (laughs) you know. Yeah, but I didn't mind that. (laughs) (laughs) That's that's my point. (laughs) I know. Like I said, I'm being petty and quibbling, but. Nevertheless, it reminds me of that other thing I didn't like. So I'm like, ah. well, see, the, to me, and I think this gets uh, mentioned in the feedback section. Um, like, they also have kind of a tacked on feel to the rest of the episode. Uh, like yeah. the first, the first two uh, episodes, um, the gray scenes have this like tacked on feel. They're not Afterthought. really. They're not. Well, no, not really, but. It's almost like they're um, they're there to keep that plot going, and the the store there's no story attached to it. You know, I mean, we see Adira go through quite a bit in this episode, but none of it really had to do with Gray, except for maybe at the end when um, Gray kind of like talks to them. Um, when uh they have you know a good day at work um he talks to them and uh you know says to to them that they they have a a good um they had a good day so but other than that uh there really wasn't any like plot part of the whole thing so i don't know i hope that at some point that this this whole thing pays off for more than just 
um, representation, you know, like, yes, we, I think it's a good thing that there's a transgendered character in Star Trek. Um, there just better be a good reason for them to be there. Like, that sounds terrible. I don't mean it that way. I think I know what you're saying. Yeah. And it's more like the fact that have them don't have them. They feel right now. They feel like a token. That's exactly what I was thinking of. Yes. Gray feels like a token. Like, look at us. Yeah. We've got this character. He's a token character who's who's there so that we can say, look at us. We've got this character, but he's not really doing anything. Yes. Ex- that's, that's what exactly I mean by point. it feels like he's an afterthought because yeah. it's like, well, I guess we better throw these scenes in. Okay. What can we do? Okay. Let's do it right here. Yeah. So that we can say that, oh, you know, I mean, honestly, I, I don't, <laughs> I'm not, not going to say that. It feels like they, I I want more. Yeah. I have no problem with him being there and him existing and him whatever whatever. But he needs to have a I purpose. Need more. Yeah. Yeah. He- I need more from him. And yeah. I feel like it's doing a disservice. It's just it's checking a box. It's yeah. like Michael was saying about Rillick last season yeah. or last episode. Ticking I feel a box, like she's yeah. check ticking a box. Well, that's kind of how it feels like they're what they're doing with Gray. Yeah. Give us more yeah Get, do right by this character yeah that's how i feel yeah i agree with you that that's uh that's a good way to put it and yeah token is exactly what i was thinking is that you know without giving gray a purpose a purpose the, a, a reason for being other than yeah. just being a token right yeah. It's it's a disservice to the character. So hopefully, you know, maybe once they have built the um, the golem and and uh, mm-hmm. and he is incorporated into the golem, that uh, you know he will actually have a purpose. Because right now, and maybe then I won't feel so icky. Yeah, yeah. Like you know, <laughs> you know who knows? It won't I, remind me so much of that thing I don't like because they'll actually have. A reason for being there yeah. rather than just being a token. Yeah. Yeah. That's the point. It just, it does feel like um, this is a token transgendered character that is there mm-hmm. just to be there. And uh, it, it shouldn't be that way. You know, we, we should mm-hmm. have a character on there that we love, that does interesting things. Like, that's what we want to see. You know, like we, I think we, most people are already like really, really love, uh, Adira. I, you know, mm-hmm. I think she's fantastic. She, see that, that whole it's thing. Hard. It's yeah. I'm, I'm just, old. Just say the name again. <laughs> I think Adira is fantastic. Yes. Adira is great. Adira is great. Adira yes. is wonderful. Yes. They are wonderful. <laughs> um, anyway, please don't be offended by my, um, my oldness. <laughs> <laughs> Same Yes. Anyway, um, it's a new thing for me still. So um, I'm, I'm going to slip, but I understand that both the actor and the um, character want to be called they and referred to as them. So that's Pronouns fine. Pronouns are they. Yeah. 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 It's an adjustment for yeah. some of us. And for that matter, I saw um, one of a YouTuber that uh, goes by she and them. So it's not always, you know, the same for everybody. Mm-hmm. So anyway. Uh, I think that honestly is more along the lines of you can say either. Yeah. Like you can say she or you can say they. Either one is fine. Yeah. Yeah. Which I would say the same about me. You can say she, you can say they, if you're not sure. I don't really care. It doesn't bother me either way. Yeah. You can even say he. I won't respond to that. <laughs> Please don't say he. <laughs> I don't really care. And, and don't say, I, don't, I, and don't say she to me either. <laughs> I, I won't, say, I won't, it won't make me feel any particular way other than that you messed up. <laughs> yep. Which doesn't bother me at all because that's something that you did, not me. <laughs> all right. So what's your next no? <laughs> um, <laughs> I 
oh gosh, I just uh, did not like the whole. I felt like the argument between or about should book go or should book not go was back ass word. It was like, okay. it should be the girlfriend that wants him to go, that wants him to have a purpose, that wants him to have closure, that wants him to feel like he's, you know, contributing or whatever. It should be the girlfriend that wants those emotional things for him. It should be the captain who says, no, you are emotionally compromised. You are not clear headed. You should not be doing this. But they, 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 they inverted it. They screwed it up. I'm like, what, what, what? (laughs) I did not understand any of those things at all. And then Saru coming in and saying, well, I think, you know, as captain that he should be allowed. I'm like, no, 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 no. As captain, she should definitely not be behind him doing this. She should be the yeah, um, yeah, your I, emotional side is your personal side. Your logic side is your captain side. Emotionally, I want you to have and be and do all these things. But logically, you are not ready for this. Yeah, You might think that you're ready for this. but And this is the whole... Like this is one of the things I I guess I should have said this in my yeses also. I feel like in the the whole dealing of mental issues what have you in this episode, I feel like they were well done because it's still like I said, it's still unknown, it's unknowable, it's hard to predict. I mean, you can say uh, again, you know, it's like a crazy person saying I'm not crazy, but then how would you know? Because you're crazy, (laughs) you know? And I mean, it's, how would you know if you're being clear headed or not? Right. Like you, it's those, it's those times when you need that outside, um, outsider person who knows you well to look at you and say, I don't feel like you are reacting like yourself. Right. Basically like being clear headed is being how you normally would be. Maybe normally you're not a clear headed person. So therefore that's not really a right, you know, turn of phrase to use or what have you. But like normally if, if you know someone and you can see, if you know someone as well as I think book and Michael know each other, you can see when someone is not themselves. Yeah. And I feel like the captain should be uh, able to take that information from the girlfriend and say, mm, no, the yeah. girlfriend wants you to do and be the captain has to say no. And I just felt like all of those scenes and arguments were just back ass word. I was like, nope, I'm not having any of this. I don't like how they did this. I don't understand why they did it this way. After getting on to her last week about not being the, you know, logical Kobayashi Maru captain. And then this week they're doing this. I just, it does not make any sense to me and I didn't like it. And it's a huge giant. No, for me, Uh. like just no all the way around. Mm. Like I, I, okay. Yes. He would have ended up going anyway, but the whole argument thing, I was like, what is going on here? Like I feel like I'm being ghosted because they're making me question myself. And I'm like, no, I am right. They are wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, there was like a, almost like she had this like dual yes, dual no kind of thing going on. And it was almost like she switched reasons mid midway you know like first first she acted like the captain didn't want him to go and then she acted like the captain wanted him to go but the girlfriend didn't want him to go you know and Mm -hmm. yeah and again i understand that too the girlfriend is scared for him and wants him to be safe but at the same time you know the girlfriend also wants him to succeed and thrive you know all that stuff that i already said right so i don't know i just it just seemed backwards to me i'm like 
yeah, the girlfriend wants him to be safe and it's dangerous, but that also didn't seem like her either because they both always, not both always, but they are in professions that could be dangerous. And I don't think that she, as a girlfriend, would act that way, would want him to would want to put him in a little in a little box on a shelf and so that he could never be broken. You know, that just didn't seem genuine either. Yeah, I I get where you're coming from there. So, what else you got? And she's she's right about him about her arguing to go. Of course she would argue to go, just the way that he is too, but that doesn't mean that either of them would be right in that situation. One of them does need to be cool-headed and logical and whatever, clear-headed, whatever. So yeah. Blah. That's how I, that's what I have to say about that. Blah. Um, let me see what else. Um, I think almost everything else I have could be a whole draw horses. So that's all I got. All right. Um, so we know that uh, Saru comes on and he, he's like, well, I, I would be honored to be your first out officer. And of course, uh, we see Burnham say, you know, yes, basically. So does that mean that there was no first officer for the first five months? I guess so. You know, so which th- makes no sense. Whatsoever. No, it makes no sense. So <laughs> that and that's something that we talked about last week. It's like who who's the first officer? Well, it sounds like no one was the first officer. Yeah, and like that, there's no clear chain of command, right? Which is impossible in a ship like that. You yeah. always have to have a clear chain of command. Yeah, I mean, the only one I can think of that might have been the. Uh, first officer was Reese. I mean, was it Reese because he got the con a couple of times or did they rotate it or, you know, so I, I don't I mean, know, but that doesn't make any sense either. Oh, and, and one other thing too, that, um, I said last week that was wrong, um, was, uh, so it could have been in the errata as well Is I had thought that they had all, uh, been sorry that they had some of them have been Lieutenant junior grade. Well, they must've gotten promotions. Um, the ones that weren't that, that the ones that were Lieutenant junior grade must've had promotions in, um, season three or before we got to season three, because they were also full lieutenants. So they all went up at the same time. So, um, so everyone on that bridge is a, is a, Lieutenant commander. So anyway, um, (laughs) so that was one thing I got wrong. Um, but the point being that, uh, it seemed like there was no first officer being declared there. So, cause it's not like anyone stepped down from the position, you know, and we can assume that it wasn't, uh, Tilly because I I don't know. Was it Tilly? we didn't see her. She was first officer at one point in time right. when Saru was captain. Right. But. Yeah. I don't know. This whole rank thing is so twisty and convoluted on this show. Yeah. It's probably something that I could say constantly would be a no because they just don't. They have. They. they well, I have less. They of always a, screw it up. I have. <laughs> I have less of a problem. Um. The you know, like Saru being on the discovery and him having the rank of captain and being first officer, than I do the fact that they didn't have a first officer before. Because the reason, because we have had this very thing already, and it goes way back to the original, you know, the original crew, the I won't say the original series, but in. Star Trek five and six, we see that Spock and Kirk both have the rank of captain. And for that matter, Scotty has the rank of captain, right? So Mm -hmm. there's, there is a precedent there. Um, I don't have a problem with that. I just have a problem with the fact that it seems like there there was no first officer um, defined. So anyway, uh, the next thing is, 
Hi, this is Tilly. And before I'm going to tell you that we're about to hit another wave, I'm going to say two or three sentences first. (laughs) (laughs) So, uh, get to the point and, you know, she's been getting to the point, but it just seemed like, um, you know, the proper thing would be to say another wave in five seconds, you know, or, or something, but instead she wastes all these like extra is. Yeah. That, that was, um, crazy yeah. and not believable even for Tilly. So. And unnecessary. Right. The last thing, and I mentioned, uh, David Ajala and his performance. Well, his performance was so good that he was supposed to be on the ready room this week. And, um, we're recording this on Saturday, um, the 27th of November. And of course we have that new news that we'll be talking about. And, um, you know, it had already happened when our episode was released, but I, I didn't, uh, change it to, reflect the news, but, you know, there's been some developments about having discovery available for at least some international viewers, not, it may not be everyone. It may not be everywhere, but, um, a lot of people can now get it that couldn't get it last week. So anyway, so there was supposed to be an episode of the ready room and it's still not there. So I I don't know what's going on with it. Usually, um, like from discovery and lower decks. And I think during Picard as well, they were releasing those episodes. Um, I think at either 10 or 11 AM, um, Eastern time, the day that the episode was released. And for whatever reason this week, it's not out there yet. I don't know what's going on, why it's, uh, not been released. I mean, are they, did, did this happen because it's Thanksgiving? <laughs> I know that doesn't make any sense. No. If, that were, if they were going to do that, then they would have just not released the episode right. on Thanksgiving, American right. Thanksgiving, I should say. Yeah. So I, I don't know what's, what's going on uh, if, if they skipped a week or whatever, but um, if you are looking for the, the episode of the ready room and, uh, saying that you can't find it. Um, to that, I neither say, can we, <laughs> yeah, neither can we. Now that said, there is a, a teaser for next week that is available. And you can, if you go to the, uh, star Trek, is it the star Trek on Paramount on P plus, uh, Instagram account. And, um, I think also on Star Trek on uh, Paramount plus uh, Facebook, they're there. And I have a link to it on the, uh, in in the Facebook group, but there it's not. Why aren't they doing it at the end of the show? That's what I don't know. I I don't know either. To be highly irritating. It's like suddenly we're just changing everything for the halibut. (laughs) Yeah. I don't know why. I don't like it. It irritates me. I like seeing the scenes. Yeah, I, I do mean, too. If they even want to wait to show the scene, I mean, I understand some people don't like scenes, but if they wanted to wait to show them until the end of the credits, I would be fine with that. Just don't make me have to go hunt somewhere else. That's one thing that irritated me the most about a lot of streaming services is that they just won't show you the scenes from next week and you got to go hunt for it and find it somewhere else, which I don't yeah. understand that. Why do you not do You do that on network TV. Like, are you just, do you just think that because I'm paying for it, I don't want to see the scenes or I'm definitely coming back or because I'm definitely coming back, I don't want to see the scenes. I don't know, but it bothers me. And if anyone from Paramount ever hears this, get your shit together. <laughs> <laughs> Well, the, like the walking dead had an issue with this, um, at at least for one season might've been for two where they were putting in the, the thing for next week, um, in the middle of another show. And, uh, I don't like that either. Why would you do that? I, I don't, I don't like that either. So you would like have to watch, say the, the, like the cold open and the first act of that 
uh, show before they would actually get to the scenes from the next episode. So I don't know. It just it's just dumb. But I don't really understand what they've done this week and the fact that it's not available at all, especially when on the, the last Red episode they week. said they said you know coming is David Ajala next week. Yeah, we're talking to David Ajala. So yeah. Obviously, you didn't mean next week because next week is now, and there's no David Ajala. Yeah. So, so I don't setting know, me up for failure. Like, did did something happen that the episode didn't get didn't get made or something? You know, was it was that the issue or what? I don't I don't know. I haven't uh, I haven't been able to find an answer for it. So I don't know. It's anyway, dumb. that's all I can say is it's dumb. It is. Okay, so. Now is time for some things that we're scratching our heads over. It's time for <laughs> Tilly to say. Hello, this is Captain Tilly. What the he- heck hell? What the hell? Hold your horses. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Oh, Captain Tilly. All right. First, we have LT from NC who says, So the thing that bugs me about Discovery is we have to have some huge galaxy-threatening thing each season. Guess we can't just have some normal crisis to deal with. Crises is actually the plural of crisis. Yes. LT, just in case you didn't know. I think he he does know. I think it was like like sometimes we'll... Are you being funny? He is. He is because sometimes we'll mention on the walking dead talk through, um, instead of calling him sauces, we'll call him saucy. Saucy. Yep. <laughs> All right, fine. I retract my previous correction. Yep. Some crises, crises. <laughs> well, to that end though, I agree with you. It does seem to be. Yes. Well, th- there's me too. Yeah. I mean, even it seems like the only time that didn't really happen was the first season. First season. That's what I was going to say. The first season had had a had a war, had its major you know. other flaws, but not that one. Yeah, <laughs> but it was like you know a crisis and uh, big one, the Klingon Federation war. Yeah, and yeah, which was a big deal for the Klingons and the Federation. Yeah, but didn't really impact anybody else. They were kind of like, okay, whatever, do your thing. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, the, you know, season two definitely had, had a, a thing that affected the galaxy and season three definitely affected the entire galaxy and Mm -hmm. season four looks like it might like they're heading that way. Yeah. Yeah. And this Mm -hmm. one, instead Mm -hmm. of like it affecting everyone at the same time, it's going to be this, um, anomaly that just you know roving yeah crisis yep it's gonna be just a a random like hey we'll end up over here and hey we end up over there (laughs) so Mm -hmm. anyway which of course disco will be the only one who can do it because they have jump capability right right all right next is wes from minnesota he says I don't think this emotional moment between book and Stamets was earned just yet. Um, I don't know. I mean, I I kind of think it was earned mm. because because they they had the um, the thing the you know the way Stamets said that he felt hopeless that he couldn't you know that's why he that's why he was so desperate to take the discovery back to the dilithium planet to get his, his family. Mm-hmm. Um, and then he couldn't. So, you know, he was dependent upon, um, book to do it and book did it, but yeah. So I, I get it. Um, and I get yeah. what, I guess what, I guess I do get what you're saying, but I thought it was earned enough. Were, I mean, were they close friends before, though? It didn't really. No. I mean, yeah. I, mean, I was like, uh, I, that's what I didn't understand, really. I was like, well, it's not like they were BFFs prior to the bur- the Dilithium Planet Crisis. So, I mean, Stamets is awkward at the best of times. 
So it's not like he's, you know, the great conversationalist who's suddenly going <laughs> to know how to connect to people who are grieving. I just, I don't know. That's kind of how I felt about it. I was like, uh, it just didn't seem like, I mean, he did a great job being his normal awkward self, but the whole, I don't know. I just kind of, I kind of get what you're saying too, a little bit. Yeah. Less. That's kind of how I felt about it. It's like, I, it didn't really feel, I don't know. Yeah. It felt a little off, I guess, is all I could really say. Yeah. So yeah, I get that. All right. Next. All right. Next, we have Will from SoCal, who says, please hold my horse. Is Dr. Kolber a medical doctor or a psychiatrist? I really don't care which, because he is great at both. Um, as far as I know, psychiatrists are medical doctors. Yes. So he probably, I would, I would surmise being in the whatever century that he came from, where he was educated, that they, due to the increases in technology that make certain things more um, easy, let's just say uh, that you could probably have more than one specialty and it's probably necessary for you to have more than one specialty serving on a starship. Well, yeah. And I was thinking that it would probably be important for uh, a starship, you know, medical doctor to also have um, psychological or psychiatric training because they would have to deal with the, you know, the issues of, of space travel and especially, um, like, you know, if, if the crew is on one of those five-year missions, they're going to be away from their family uh, potentially for five years. And, uh, you know, that has its own issues. So, Mm -hmm. you know, I guess I would say the only thing I can, I mean, I can, I can understand why a single um, medical professional would be uh, well-versed, shall we say, in more than one specialty is because on um, uh, TNG, we had Troy, who was counselor, shifts counselor. And that's kind of the position that a psychiatrist would fill normally, I guess. So yeah. I think that's why it seems like they shouldn't be both. But really, I think that that was probably more abnormal than normal, especially for like a smaller ship, if that makes sense. Yeah. Like a ship with not with that doesn't have a giant complement would have multiple people doing multiple things, filling multiple roles. Yeah. Rather than just one for each. I'm like, in a city, you can have one or more for each, right? But on a ship like that, you would need to have people doing more than one role. Every person is probably fulfilling more than one role. Right. Yeah, I would agree with that. Uh, All right. And our last bit of hold your horses is for Mike from Arizona and he doesn't really have any, (laughs) but I didn't know where else to put this. He says, uh, I don't have any. And he says, I hope everyone who celebrates Thanksgiving had a wonderful holiday filled with love, family, and friends. Yay. And, uh, yeah. So, all right. What do you have for hold your horses? Um, did Michael forget that she's also a scientist? How do you mean? Well, it seemed like she was often, I don't know. It just, I felt, I was like, man, she could be sciencing also. Like, I I know that she's a captain too, but she's, I don't know. I just, I was like, Uh, man, she's also a scientist. Yeah. Asking for scientific observations, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, um... Yeah. You were the chief science officer, so yeah. make your own science op- observations. Yeah, as is Saru, you know, so, mm-hmm. you know. Almost everybody on that ship is a scientist, except for, like, the pilot and yeah. the, you know, 
con, whatever. Those like it seems like the only people who weren't scientists are the strictly bridge crew people. Yeah. Everybody else was already or was a scientist before and in some cases chief scientist, chief science officer. Yeah. So Yeah. Kind of I don't know. It just felt like I was like, "Man, why what <laughs> I don't know. I'm like, yeah, she has other things to deal with right now, but also, like, you're also a scientist. Don't forget. Yeah. It seemed like they, not Michael, obviously, but the writers are forgetting. Uh, Michael has a science background. She went to the Vulcan Science Academy. Yeah. <laughs> blah, blah, blah. And was yeah. chief science officer. Right. Yada, yada, yada. Yeah. Yeah, I um, could see that. I could see that. I don't know. It just kind of, I was just kind of like, eh. Um, also, it seems like sometimes, like, I don't know. They really set themselves up to shoot themselves in the foot with the sphere data. Because on the one hand, that could totally be your get out of jail free card. Every episode, well, let's just consult the sphere data. So it, it kind of feels like, did they really think that all the way through? I mean, I love season two. It's probably my fav- favorite season. But I feel like there should have been some way to extricate it once they reach the future and have it off somewhere for study. because Rather than having it turn the ship into a sentient you know, AI. Because then basically, why don't they always just say, Zora, what should we do? I mean, you know what I mean? It's kind of like that's your deus ex machina forever because we've got this sphere data. Yeah. I mean, for that matter, why aren't they, um, you know, they could have had the sphere data analyzing everything. Exactly. Or did they not consult the sphere data? I mean, how long had the sphere been collecting, going through the galaxy, the universe, whatever, collecting data? Well, I mean. Thousands of years. Well, so, they, do say, they do say all known da- databases. So right. I'm assuming. I guess that, they're including the sphere data yeah. in that. But doesn't that seem sort of unlikely that nothing like this has ever happened before in how many years? Kind of. Eh, that's, uh, that's why it's a hold your horses. Not really a no. Because yeah. I'm like, seems unlikely. I mean, eh, it's kind of like, well, again, I feel feel like that's something that should be explained. And rather than explaining it, Zora named herself, which I was like, yeah, that's cool. And now it, you know, related back to that uh, short track. But on the other hand, it's kind of like, um, so why doesn't that mean you could just ask Zora every time? Zora, how, I mean, like they did. In this episode, which I did, I forgot about that. I thought that was really cool. Status report. I can't reach my station. (laughs) Uh, That was cool. But then she just asked Zora and it was like, yeah, I mean, if I had a supercomputer to tell me the secrets of life all the time and, you know, whatever, I would probably be like, hey, Zora. I mean, it's like a super way advanced version of Hey Siri or Hey Alexa. You know? I mean, Hey Zora, what's the weather outside going to be today? Hey Zora, what should I wear today? Hey Zora, what are, you know, (laughs) X, Y, Z. Hey Zora, can you predict, can you come up with a predictive algorithm for the best stock to invest in where I can make a whole bunch of money and retire in three years? You know, I mean, just... (laughs) I don't know. It just seemed like it's way too easy to to have it be a shortcut. And I don't really, I it's a double-edged sword. I don't like that they ignore it, that, that, that it's there. But then on the other hand, I would definitely not like it if it was just there all the time, used all the time, and used as a, you know, the deus ex machina, blah, blah, blah thing. Yeah. I feel like I wish they sh- they could have done something to extract that from the ship, which it would of course negated that um uh, episode of Short Trek Calypso because well, <laughs> and maybe that's um what ends up happening is uh they just 
store it somewhere, you know, that no one can get to it. Maybe, but I just feel like they should have done something to address it by now. Like right. offloaded it into something so that there could be people studying it rather than having it be this supercomputer where I could just say, you know, yeah, could just hey Siri it basically right. for the answer. Just like I feel like it should be people studying this data rather than just having it so easily accessible. Right. That they forget so easily accessible that they forget to access it. So Yeah, I agree with you on that point. And uh I mentioned something about this that it's kind of a two edged sword because it makes Calypso actually uh, more likely that it's going to be canon. And to me, it would have been better if it wasn't canon because mm -hmm. you have the situation that in Calypso, the ship that has been, you know, abandoned or whatever that, uh, what was his name? And, and, uh, I can't remember now. Oh, I can't remember his name. Yeah. Anyway, the ship that he comes across isn't the Discovery A, it's the Discovery. It's the NCC 1031, not the 1031A. So, um, you know, that's a canon violation there. There's, mm -hmm. there's a, you know, th that doesn't, those two things don't align. So how does, how yeah, does I that wish happen? I had come up with a way to like have it branch off or something somehow. Yeah. And maybe know. that's what will happen. Maybe, you know, somehow they'll come up with some way of doing that, but I, yeah. I don't know how that would happen at this point. Right. At this point, which is why it's just a hold your horses at this point. Because right. Because I'm like, what are you doing here? Not to mention the whole get out of jail free card with the supercomputer AI you've got with the sphere data in your back pocket, just waiting to be remembered and used. <laughs> yep. What else? Um, I, while on the one hand, I appreciate the intricacies of the mental issues that are happening this episode with everybody's dealing with PTSD. On the other hand, I feel like I don't know that, I mean, I don't know. I've never had PTSD that I can really say to the best of my knowledge, I suppose I should say. Um, so I don't know, but would it make him not trust Michael? Because, I, and this is why this is a hold your horses, because I don't know. But I feel like when there should have been another reason why he didn't catch that first wave, rather than questioning her because she said, you have to go when I say, and even hesitating a little bit to ask, are you sure? Yeah. That's not going when I say. Right. Um, I just kind of feel like that was a little like it sh there should, I, I get the, you know, the drama tension, whatever of having, um, having him miss the first wave. I'm not mad at that. Right. I'm mad at the way that it happened. Yeah. I'm like, I feel like they should have come up with a different way rather than, are you sure? Well, yes, she's sure. Yeah. I'm like, you know, this is something like. Should have just had a I miss. Guess, you know? Yeah. Just yeah. The, like, oh crap, I missed it. Well, yeah. yeah, that's fine. You missed it. No, no big, I mean, and then he get he gets all defeatist and whatever whatever, right? And we have to have the private channel moment, yada yada yada. Yeah, but goes, the whole goes and sees uh, his nephew. <laughs> yeah, the whole "are you sure" thing just kind of felt like I don't know. And I would have been, ugh, I don't know, I would have been just totally wanting to kick his ass if it were if it were me and be like, seriously. And I would have had one of those inappropriate arguments. This is why I didn't want you to go. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I mean, yeah, I don't know. I just I just felt like it just didn't seem I don't know. I mean, hey, I don't need a tether and I don't need a minder, blah, blah, blah. I'm going to be a cranky little child right now. 
You know, I mean, like, in, in a normal situation, he would not be complaining about a tether, honestly. Yeah. I mean, I would be like, you're going to hang me down from a helicopter or you want me to swim in this whirlpool when you could like hang me down from a helicopter and I could swim in the whirlpool. Let's do the tether. I mean, you know, (laughs) I I, I didn't, I didn't understand that whole, like, I don't need a tether thing. I'm like, uh, any sane person would appreciate having some way to snap them back into reality. But, and, and I guess, while I'm talking about the tether, I didn't understand the whole tether thing. I'm like, why, if they could, like, is the tether only a certain length or something? Why couldn't they extend the tether so that they could pull back and not let him go at the same time? I mean, because did they prove that it was the tether causing them to experience these gravitational waves while I wasn't looking or something? Because yeah, I didn't I, understand the whole, we have to let you go. I'm like, why? <laughs> yeah, it's like the the tether was only so long or something i I don't know yeah which uh, explain that to me it's programmable matter which i for one thing don't understand so why can't it do and be whatever it wants (laughs) i mean did did we run out we have no more on the ship that's why we couldn't make the programmable matter tether longer or something Uh, i don't know again that's why it's a hold your horses and for that matter i don't understand the the whole the um hollow connection between Stamets and his hollow self and but we can't transfer the data back. What? <laughs> it's like we have communication, but we can't data transfer. I didn't understand that either. I was like, what is why? Why can you not? I mean, why if your connection is strong enough that he can still operate a fully functional hollow person who can make repairs on the ship why can't he transfer data back i mean it's because of the gravitational interference okay but why (laughs) i don't understand how you could have one but not the other that's Mm, my thing yeah yeah and how did they know that his ship was in the right spot for the wave if we've got all this interference and in communication and data transfer, like we can communicate, but we can't data transfer, but are we still somehow we can still find out where he is in the wave, but we can't transfer the data. What? <laughs> I don't know. Maybe it had to do with like the signal popping in and out or something. So they knew where, the ship was, but, um, they weren't getting a regular stream. I don't know. But then again, the communication didn't have any issues. Mm -hmm. She wasn't popping in and out of, uh, like the secure channel. So I I don't know. Yeah, And I mean, maybe it's different because data transfer requires more bandwidth than, you know, just a regular communication channel or something like, I mean, you know, the the issues that we have with Wi-Fi now, like if you can do more on a, you know, a 5G network than you can on the LTE network or whatever, that kind of a thing, maybe. Maybe they were getting significant interference such that they couldn't connect with 5G or whatever, you know? Right. I don't know. But again, I was like, I just, I wanted a little bit more explanation. This is one of those instances where I wanted the techno babble. Like I'm usually not one to complain about techno babble because I want it because I want to know that someone is thinking science when they're thinking about the reasons behind these episodes. That's one of the reasons why I like Star Trek is because it's science based, not just science fiction based. And I feel like I'm not really getting that with the whole it didn't happen because reasons like, um, why, what were those reasons? I don't know. Mm. And someone else can explain it to me. That's fine. But I really want them to do it on the show. Yeah. All right. Um, I think that's probably all I got. Okay. As if that's not enough. (laughs) Well, I'm going to bring up the obvious here, but I'm, uh, Surprised no one else brought it up. Um, I like Saru being the XO on the ship. 
and um mm -hmm. you know his his role you know being a, an xo and he, you know he seemingly got more wiser and serene uh being in Kaminar. um you know i i don't know if what the result was but just feeling a peace maybe with with the world because uh he came back to a Kaminar that is much different than the one that uh, he left. Um, mm -hmm. Connecting with his roots. Right. However, I am worried about um, him being the XO because I'm worried he is going to fall into the Riker trap. In other words, he has to keep turning down commission after commission to be the captain of his own ship just so he can remain ca uh, the uh the first officer on discovery. Mm. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't want that to happen again. Um, I thought that it was a poor, um, you know, thing that uh, he had to, he had to do like, it seemed like this went on at least, you know, once a season. <laughs> I don't think it was that, that often, but it certainly happened uh, multiple times over the course of next gen. And of course he finally does take his own, uh, commission, you know, in, uh, nemesis, but, uh, I just don't want the, you know, we, we now have, uh, the first time with the USS sojourner. Uh, we don't know if that's mm -hmm. like one of the experimental ships or if it's, uh, just, a, another ship, but, um, you know, it's another ship. So let's hope that, he uh, gets another commission somewhere and maybe they incorporate that second ship in season five or, or something. But I just don't want, I like the idea of him being first officer for this season four, but for season five, they're going to have to do something else with the character. I just don't, I don't want him being in this role again. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, next thing, um, I find it a little odd for Tarina to be the one to bring up civil unrest. Could there be unrest going on in the VAR, uh, as a result? Um, like it just, it seemed odd for a Vulcan basically to, to bring this up as opposed to, I don't know, one of the other, um, species from the Federation. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah. You know, so we see a Ferengi, we see a, a number of species there and, uh, you know, the Navarians or whatever with, uh, Tarina. Um, but where are the Klingons? We still haven't seen Klingons on this show since season two. They have been conspicuously absent and you would think that at a time like this, uh, there would be a reason to bring in uh, Klingons into the discussion. There has been all sorts of um, controversy with the Klingons in this era of uh, Star Trek. Like, mm -hmm. you know, especially in season one, you go back and those Klingons do not look at all like the Klingons that we knew from... Uh, you know, the Berman era and it could be handled like they did in Picard where we had Romulans with the smooth forehead and we had Romulans with the bumpy forehead, you know, and they were Northern Romulans and Southern Romulans. I, mean, we could have where there are some houses that have the crazy pointy head Klingons and some that have <laughs> the hairy Klingons or whatever that's fine. I don't think that there's a, there's an issue with that, but we don't have anything right now in the 32nd century about the Klingons and they're just continuously not mentioned at all. So I just would like them to finally address that on this show. Anyway, yeah. that was point. the thought. Very good point. Yeah. All right, so let's move on to our next section, and that is uh, feedback, and let's open hailing frequencies. 
All right. So we only got one voicemail this week, and that's from Jeff X Force 11, uh, keeping his streak alive. Hello, Star Trek fans. What an amazing episode of Discovery. I really like the fact that they addressed the PTSD that our characters are going through with the loss of a world, being on away missions that cause things to go crazy and the loss of life, the real practical effects that people in situations like these have to deal with on a day-to-day basis. And I really like that. I love the fact also that we're getting to see more of the crew and getting them to see them play their vital parts in the role rather than just our key characters. I feel like Discovery is really at a stride and going well, and this episode was just frankly amazing, and I cannot wait to see what's next because I feel like we are in a good rhythm of writing and directing and a storyline that is so good, and it just amazes me, and I really wish more people would check out this show. All right, those are my thoughts. X-Force 11 is out. Well, thank you so much, Jeff, X-Force 11, for your voicemail, keeping the streak alive. And uh, I agree. I wish that uh, more people would give this show a chance. We've kind of said that from the beginning. And I think um, I think more people have given the show a chance. Um, you know, it's like I don't see that just that wave of negativity that we used to see before we still see. And we're especially seeing it now, the people that are griping about having to pay for another streaming service. And we're especially getting that from the international viewers, which I would say understandably so, but, um, I think that, uh, it going to Paramount Plus, and I think the other shows will end up there as well. I I think that's inevitable. And uh, yeah, if you guys get this show or Picard um, through something other than Paramount Plus, you should be prepared to um, subscribe Lose to access. Paramount Plus when the time comes for it to switch over, and just be prepared. It's going to happen. You know. Or just be prepared to lose access. Or be prepared to lose access. And, and you know, I I hope that they will do what they've, I think, done, and, and that has made it available for purchase uh, in the countries that don't have it, you know, streaming yet. But, you know, we'll, we'll see. So, uh, yeah. And I, what I have to say about that is welcome to our world. Yeah. I mean, it's, we've, we've had this issue from beginning, um, you know, so anyway, that we're kind of going off a, on a little, uh, mini Blaine. Tangent. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I agree about the PTSD, uh, coverage, you know, and we're kind of getting too. that on multiple and it's like Tilly's having a bit of, um, PTSD. Although I think, I think that she is having other issues and, you know, I kind of talked about that last week. Um, it seems that I'm right. Although it seems, like I said, she's going through some other things than just it, just being about, uh, commander Nalas and, you know, those other two losing their lives in that mission. Um, and we don't know if those people were on discovery or if they were, you know, um, on the station or if they were, who knows, we don't, we don't know, but, um, something else is going on with her, you know? So I I think maybe she's a little homesick or, or whatever. I don't know. We'll see. I don't know. Um, do you have anything you wanted to say about Jeff's voicemail? No, I think that was pretty much it. Okay. All right. So, Next bit is from Kyle from Illinois and Lower Decks. You want to take that one? 
All righty. Let's see. Kyle says, overall, a great episode and really intrigued about this black hole going to destroy everything thing. Also, that subspace gravitational wave that sent everyone off their chairs and suspended in midair. It was a new play on the usual people thrown from their chairs after a photon torpedo hit or whatever. You could almost feel it. It was really well done. Yep. Agreed. I agree as well. Our last bit of feedback is from Brian from Colorado. And he says, I don't have time to write much feedback this week. While having Saru back was nice, I didn't think most of the anomaly scenes made sense, especially the supposed bad blood between Stamets and Book. That came out of left field. The callback to Picard felt forced, and any scene with Gray really grates on my nerves. I guess you're not the only one. Nope. I did think Book's portrayal on someone grieving was excellent. And, um, I would say that the Stamets and book stuff, um, I wouldn't say it came out of left field, but it's something I certainly wasn't aware of. So I was uh, surprised because, I mean, I thought that the issues that Stamets was having were between Stamets and Burnham, not Stamets and book. They did sort of make it seem like that at the end of last season. Yeah. And the, the only way he thing, was like cold shoulder. Yeah. And the only thing that we get this time was, you know, him saying, blow me out an airlock, blow me out an airlock. And, you know, of course, Stamets being the, um, insensitive or just like clueless type saying these stupid things like, you know, oh, you know, it did just come across a planetary system. <laughs> That was yeah, a dumb but thing to say. <laughs> no, it wasn't though. That's it was accurate, and oh, okay. sometimes I don't. I don't feel like it was. Sometimes the truth hurts, and you can't tiptoe around it all the time for someone's feelings, especially in a situation like that. Which is another reason why he should not have been there. Because if something like a simple comment about the reason why there's so much debris is because it just went across a planetary field is going to throw him off so much. That's why he, that's another reason why he shouldn't have been there. And the whole don't ever ask me that again. I'm like, again, another reason a normal person would not be so upset about a normal, I say normal, a person who's not going through what he's going through right now would not be so upset by someone questioning whether or not they're okay. They would understand this is a normal question to ask. If you are freezing up in the middle of a um, stressful situation, hey, are you okay? <laughs> like, don't ask me that again. I'm like, okay, grouchy pants. Um, <laughs> are you sure grouchy pants. you're okay to be on this on this mission right here? Because, you know, I don't know. I mean, another thing is grouchy he's pants. Gotta be dealing yeah, he's got to be dealing with survivor's guilt and yeah, he is. people who are dealing with survivor's guilt should not be sent on what could be construed as a suicide mission. So there's that oh, as yeah. well. Just another reason why he should not have been allowed to go on this mission. Emotionally compromised. As Spock said, I just lost my entire planet. I assure you, I'm emotionally compromised. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with everything you said there. Yeah, I agree with most of what Brian said. I think Book's portrayal of someone grieving was pretty excellent. I mean, grief hits everybody differently. Um, It's not always a straight line, but the scenes with Gray also great on my nerves. (laughs) I and I I didn't didn't think I didn't find that the callback to Picard felt forced. It did feel um, a bit fan servicey, but I don't mind fan service. So, you know, mm, I don't know that I would say it felt forced or fan servicey. It just kind of was. Yeah, I, I, to me, it felt like they were linking the. Um, there was a link, I guess, yeah. more than a. It was a link between the two shows to show that they're still in the same universe i guess to me that's kind of how i felt. Yeah. i didn't really i didn't mind it i didn't like the scenes with gray though so i would say it didn't well it didn't feel forced i didn't really appreciate it because 
I'm just not digging the whole. Yeah. That's, and it's like, it's like we said, it, it, he still feels like a token character and they need to give him a purpose. And yeah. once they give him a purpose, assuming it's a good purpose, then <laughs> I think our, you know, attitudes towards that will, will change. Um, Maybe. But, I'm still going to be irritated about it because of the whole dilithium planet fiasco. Well, okay. <laughs> but I mean, the fact that I might feel better about it. I mean, he existed prior to that. So, you know, he did, but he should not have been able to communicate with anyone else or been given a hollow body or. <sighs> yes, anyway, I, I know. I, you know, I, yeah. <laughs> anyway. And you know, I mean, for that matter, that, that is another, um, option for him to like a portable hollow emitter and just make the hollow emitter available to, I don't know, of course he would have to be by, um, a deer side all the time, <laughs> but you know, that would, that yeah, would be another way. Well, what are they going to do with him once he gets a body, once he incorporates? <laughs> well, that's that's what I was wondering as well. Like, is he going to go away? Like, wouldn't Adira still see him? I don't know. You know, because if they're just incorporating his consciousness, um, he's still going to be there. Does like, that mean they're removing his consciousness from her, him, they, they yeah, them? Yeah, that's that's the question that I would have is... Where does his consciousness go? Does it go into this golem and it it's just gone Leaves from Adira? Adira? Or do we suddenly have two of them? Because that's mm. what, that's what I'm thinking is going to be the case. There's going to be two grays. And then how annoying is that going to be if, if neither one has a purpose? <laughs> uh, super annoying. Oh, boy. I don't that was another another thing I had. Like, how exactly is a figment of your imagination, so to speak, able to sneak up on you? Yeah. <laughs> I didn't understand that at all. <laughs> oh yeah, that's true. You talking about you talking about that one scene in her in um Adira's, Adira's quarters. Bedroom. Yeah. Yes, Adira's quarters, yes. <gasps> I'm like, what? Yeah, what was it? Deer getting? It, it's look like it looks like uh, they were trying to get something from inside their boots or something. I didn't. I I think a deer was unzipping. Oh, okay. The boot. It looked like a deer was uh, doing something to get something, as opposed to taking off the the boot. But I saw that the first time, and it, I can see how you would think that. But when I was watching it. Um, again, I was like, oh, it's just a boot unzip, like disrobing after a long day or changing into something that's not your uniform or whatever. But still the whole sneaking up on you thing. I was like, oh, how, how does that work? <laughs> All right. So I think that's it for our listener feedback. Do you have anything else you want to bring up? Um, let me see. I did not really understand, um, Burnham's speech at the beginning. It kind of felt like, um, they were addressing the aftermath of an attack rather than the aftermath of a natural disaster tragedy, mm. which based on what happened at the end of the episode, maybe, but they didn't know that at the time. I'm like, you might not be able to prevent either thing, but they're certainly not the same. I'm like, you can't really, I just, I don't know. It felt a little off to me. Like, it's like, it would be like the mayor of Moore standing up and saying after an uh, F5 t tornado w rips through the town, never again. I'm like, well, what are you going to do about it? I mean, <laughs> Just, I felt like, you know, you're tilting at windmills, kind of like just shaking your fist at the sky. And I mean, that's kind of the, 
feeling I got, I guess, or the idea behind that speech. And I was kind of like, uh, that we will never stuff. have a natural disaster happen again. <laughs> yeah, that will be. I mean, I mean, I can understand something more along the lines of we won't let this catch us off guard again. Yeah. We won't let it. Uh, let, let us you know we won't be unprepared again in the future but never again i mean yeah. really like you're you're shaking your fist at mother nature yeah and I, I was gonna say my experience I was, I was, that she doesn't like that i was gonna say that the this um <laughs> this thing is starting to feel like a space hurricane you know it, mm-hmm. it's uh or a space tornado you know it's it's yeah. kind of well maybe a space tornado is more um apropos because it it uh, goes where yeah, it usually wants have to. a little bit yeah well you usually have a little bit more warning for a hurricane than you do for a tornado yeah anyway. that's why I changed it from a hurricane to a tornado <laughs> yeah uh, yeah but it feels like this natural you know disaster kind of thing that uh, moves you know so and I mean. They alluded to at the end, like, we can't predict where it's going to go kind of a thing that sort of implies that it could be um, not self-directed, I guess, or directed by another entity or something. I don't know. Yeah. And I don't want that. I don't want that either. But if that is, in fact, the case, the speech at the beginning was premature. Yeah. Because... That should that speech should come after we find out that someone is doing this to us. Not yeah. like I mean, a speech after a natural disaster is it's time to come together. Let's um, you know, pick ourselves up by our bootstraps, let's pick up the pieces, let's move on. That's yep. the kind of speech you give after a natural disaster, not we'll never let this happen again. I mean, come on. I just, I didn't like it. <laughs> it felt out of place, I think, is really what I was. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I didn't really think about it too much when I gave my rating, but um, now that you say that, yeah, I, I did kind of feel that too, because it, I thought, well, how, how can she, how can, how can she say that? You know, it's, and it's, and it's not just like, um, she says, not in our watch. So that also yeah. took me to, make me think, well, you know, once it's on someone else's watch, <laughs> yeah, you know, once we're, once, um, the, the ship's been decommissioned, uh, well, it can happen again. We don't really care. Um, but, but as long as we're going on, we're going to make sure that doesn't happen again. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, I, I hesitate to say, I don't know, because on the one hand, I'm like, well, they they are able to control the weather in Star Trek. You know, they at least have a semblance of control over the weather. They can prevent things like tornadoes and natural disasters of that sort and all that kind of stuff. But that's because of their level of understanding and the scientific advancement that they've experienced. This is something that they've already said is completely unknown. So it would be the same thing as us dealing with a modern day tornado as what they're dealing with now, you know? So that's why I'm like the weather comparison, like natural disaster comparison is kind of like on the one hand, like they actually are able to control that and say never again or whatever. But on the other hand, like this is, that's, those are for known quantities and this is an unknown quantity. And I don't see how you can say how you can fight against a natural disaster like that. That's something that you don't know about or like yeah. have any kind of, yeah. you know, I don't know. That's why I was kind of especially, like, um, yeah, especially when they don't know what the heck it is, you know, mm-hmm. yeah, to be able exactly. to, to be able to so. say that this, uh, yeah. What else you got? Um, I feel like everybody forgot how brilliantly Detmer flew books ship last season yeah Yeah. i mean she did a pretty bang up job so although i don't understand why they keep saying she can't do it Mm, she kind of (laughs) did although it is worth saying um that you know she doesn't know how to make the 
ship reconfigure or whatever, which More. I guess is true. Yeah. I think, I feel like she did though in that episode, didn't she? I, I don't, I don't know. I'd have to go back and, and look at it, but I don't recall it, but I, I don't know. Then again, um, in watching She's the an outstanding pilot who can fly anything. Right. She said so. Um, one thing that, uh, I noticed is in the season premiere when, um, they took the ship down, they, um, or book actually like did the morphing of the ship and parts of the ship went under discovery and parts went over discovery. So, and then once it crossed past discovery, then it came back together. So I thought that was kind of a cool effect, but, uh, just something I noticed. So mm -hmm. what else you got? Um, let's see, let's see, let's see. Was that a real bird in the debris field or was that his imagination? I think it was his imagination. Yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, everything that he saw was imagination. So, okay. Um, I did wonder that too, but upon, I think in my second watch, I came to the conclusion that it was just his, uh, brain playing tricks on him. Mm -hmm. The only other thing I think I have is I didn't really understand that long shot at the end. Oh yeah. Yeah. I think that was just kind of a, a shortcut kind of thing. Um, an artist depiction <laughs> as opposed to something that is currently going on, but I don't know. Maybe. I mean, it seemed like it was an eye and I was like, um, well, I mean, what? it looked, it looked like a black hole, um, or something like what I've seen a black hole to do. Mm -hmm. Um, like it takes a similar shape, I think, but, uh, I've seen it with more, light around it like because it sucks in all the light i guess but yeah creation disc yeah but otherwise it looked like a black hole um anyway so okay kind of, yeah i don't know i have two things it looks like they did something to the badges and maybe it could be just the uniforms make them look um more pronounced or they actually did change the colors a little bit, but I'm definitely noticing the the pips on the badge much more this season than I did last season. I mean, last season you couldn't see them at all, and this mm -hmm. season you can definitely you can definitely make them out. And um, Saru, does that mean he's going to rebuild his garden quarters? Because he had, you know, mm. like his basically lived in a garden um on uh discovery before discovery. yeah yeah so True. i wondered about Good that question yeah i don't know i hope he does because that was really cool yeah all right so that's it for our discussion of this episode so let's move into our shipwide announcements <whistles> legends from the Burman era Mike and Denise Okuda have earned a Lifetime Achievement Award from the Art Directors Guild. So hmm. um, that's pretty cool. Uh, um, Michael Okuda is, I know, working on, I believe, Picard. I don't know if he's working on in, any other show. Oh, yeah. he's. I know he's been consulted with for um, Prodigy and especially Lower Decks. So all the, the screens and lower decks and all that have been uh, okuded. So, <laughs> yeah. And I don't know how much uh, Denise Okuda has done as far as that concerned, but I think they're pretty much a husband and wife team. So I think they're a package, but I don't know for sure. Cool. So the big news this week is Star Trek, Dis and this, this was known like after the episode, had come out, but I had already recorded it and, and I wasn't going to change what was released to like, we had already released it to uh Patreon uh, people. So I wasn't going to change it, even though we had new, you know, news developments since then. But 
Star Trek Discovery Season 4 has now been rolled out for fans outside of the U.S. and Canada now. Due to an unprecedented backlash over the November 16th announcement, countries that have Paramount Plus outside of the U.S. will have Star Trek Discovery starting um, yesterday, uh, Friday, November 26th. And there's a whole list of countries. I know it's mostly in Australia and uh, Latin America that have it. I'm not sure if all Latin American countries have it or not, but I know like Mexico, Argentina, Central American countries, most of South America has it. I don't know if it's everyone though, but there's a long list of countries now that have access to it through Paramount Plus. Countries that don't have Paramount Plus, such as the UK, now can get it via Pluto TV, which is a free service by Viacom CBS that's also it's available in the US, but I don't believe that the episodes have been made available in the US. So if you have Pluto TV and you're not in the US, I believe you will be able to see episodes of Discovery airing Friday, Saturday, and Sunday nights at 9 p.m. your local time. Now, not everybody has Pluto TV. Like I know, for example, Ireland doesn't. And um, I've heard a lot of people from Ireland complaining about it. I know that other countries are being able to get it by purchase. So again, I don't have a list of what countries there are. Uh, I'd love to hear from you if uh, you have it. And uh, if you don't, um, you know, I don't know who is getting it through um, purchase and who is getting it through Pluto and who is getting it through Paramount. Like, I think the list of Paramount Plus um, countries is out there on uh, Star Trek.com. I'm not sure which countries can get Pluto TV, though. Um, so anyway, I know a lot of Europe can get it. I think Germany can get it, uh, UK, France, but unfortunately it may be dubbed and you may not be able to get it, um, you know, in English. So just again, keep that in mind. Uh, in a cameo video posted on YouTube recently, Picard's Michelle Hurd, uh, who plays, of course, Rafi Musiker, confirmed that Whoopi Goldberg is in season two of Picard. Woohoo! Um, she's been conveniently missing from the first three trailers released so far, but she had made mention that she enjoyed working with um, Goldberg and John Delancey. So uh, that can, um, that's not like an official, official confirmation, but it's close enough. Yeah. I mean, John Delancey's made several cameos and pretty much everything that he said has turned out to be how things have gone. So, and, uh, when Paramount plus releases the 4k ultra HD restoration of the motion picture director's edition, the people who are in charge of the restoration say there may be slight changes to the film. Hmm. I don't know what that means exactly. So, and, um, next thing and final bit of news, parrot analytics, we have some parrot analytics numbers and in, um, average demand expressions, which basically is a way that the parrot analytics measures like social media demand of a show. Star Trek discovery, um, emerged as number nine on the, uh, top 10. So, We have to say, (laughs) anyway, (laughs) um, that's good. It it got 25.1 times the demand of an average show, which lands it in the outstanding um, performance. There's average, good, outstanding, and exceptional. It's in the outstanding. So... And they have 
they have two measurements of this. They have the digital originals and then they have the uh, overall, which also includes like uh, broadcast and cable. So Discovery didn't make the overall, but it did make the digital. So number one in the digital was uh, a new show. I think it's new anyway, called Arcane on Netflix. Hmm. So that was 46.6 times. And uh, we'll see how things are uh, after this week. So, because of course, there there was more news this week, and we don't know how much of it was due to the news and how much of it was due to the show, but we'll know soon enough. Okay, so that's it for this week's news. So Ruthie, why don't you take over and tell people how to contact us and send feedback. All righty. To submit your theories and feedback, go to talkthroughmedia.com slash feedback, where you can submit text or audio, or you can call our voicemail or call and leave a voicemail at 216-232-6146. You can send us an email to Star Trek Discovery at talkthroughmedia.com. You can post in our designated episode thread in our Facebook group, which is facebook.com slash groups slash Star Trek TTM podcasts. The deadline for Star Trek Discovery season four, episode three will be the normal day and time subject to change, of course, Friday, December 3rd, 2021 at 7 p.m. Eastern, 6 Central. If you would like to support us, you can do so by following us on Twitter and Instagram at Star Trek TTM. Another great way you can support us is to share us on Twitter and Facebook. Um, you can write a, write a review by going to facebook.com slash talkthroughmedia. You can subscribe to our Talk Through Media YouTube channel, which is where you'll find the new episodes out before anywhere else. You can also subscribe to us in Apple Podcasts or the podca- podcast client of your choice. While you're there, give us a rating or a review. Um, you can do that on podchaser.com. You can rate and, v- rate and review the podcast and even individual episodes. And finally, another way you can help support us is via Patreon. And we would like to take this time to thank our Patreon supporters. James Robbins, Kim Vogley, Brian Shiro, Christoph Lechleitner, Michael Carrier, Stephen Chambers, Jeff Gentry, X-Force 11, Robert Kaiser, Clint McCollum, Mike, Trey Whipke, Lawrence Todd, and Kyle McAdams, The Quail. And reminder that uh, that is the fastest way that you get our episodes. And just a dollar per month, you can get them. So that's that. Patreon.com forward slash Brian and Ruthie. So if you're not a Patreon supporter, the next fastest way to get our episodes is on YouTube because part of the process that we, we do in making the episodes, it automatically publishes a video to YouTube. So, so subscribe to us and uh, you will get notified that there's been a new episode so you can listen to it there. Um, all of our new episodes are there. The channel is the talk through media channel and all episodes, uh, within the network go there. So you also see the walking dead talk through episodes go there. Uh, and all of the podcasts from the talk through media network, uh, can be found on the talk through media, all inclusive feed. So, uh, beyond the the new Star Trek shows, you will also get the rebinged DS9 podcast and the Walking Dead talk through. And Kyle and LT are doing Fear the Walking Dead talk through right now. Um, I wasn't on this past episode for uh, season seven, episode six. I only gave my rating, um, and there's only two episodes left for uh this half season and uh world beyond has two episodes left so i'll probably be on there at least for the last episode at least partially um but i'm you know scaling myself back because of uh 
discovery, my, my true love. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so um, our next episode of the Star Trek Discovery podcast is going to be covering season four, episode three, titled Choose to Live. We don't know who's written it, but we do know that it's directed by Christopher J. Byrne. And we don't have a description yet, but um, I mentioned, I think, earlier that um, you can find the uh, trailer of it on the Instagram account and also the um, Facebook uh, page for Star Trek. And uh, it shows basically an episode that I didn't think that's where the show was going, but it shows uh, mm -hmm. Koat Malat um, look like a Koat Malat person who's killing a bunch of people. So some rogue uh, Koat Malat. So I don't know how the heck this fits into the plot of this this uh, story arc this season. It almost feels like a standalone but mm -hmm. we'll we'll see. I mean, it's it's In hard. In which to... case, I would say already. <laughs> yeah. So I don't I don't know. It's it's hard to judge that for sure based on the you know the trailer. But uh, I don't yeah. know. I, I, we'll see. I guess. Yeah, we will see. So until next time, I'm Brian, and I'm Ruthie. Peace and long life. Live long and prosper. Mm -hmm.